collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. Coming up this week, we'll be looking at the workings of the European Parliament. I've just spent several days in Strasbourg, and we'll be finding out about a new directive on the use, or at least the curtailing of the use, of plastic carrier bags. We estimate that at least a hundred billion plastic bags are used in EU everywhere. Really many of them are used only one time. And uh, 8 billion are ending up as litter, probably many more. We'll also be talking to one of Cyprus MEPs, Tagis Hadjiorgiu. I may say that this is my main goal in my life, to work to see uh, one day the Cyprus issue being solved. There's great news this week for the environment of the European Union and I guess really since the environment belongs to us all for the environment of the globe. With me it's great honour to have MEP Margrit Auken from Denmark who was the rapporteur that managed to get important new legislation through the European Parliament. Margaret, first would you just sort of outline yes. how long you've been working on this plastic bags directive, but it is something that is going to have a huge impact on everybody. Yeah, well, uh, we, we, we began because, I'm, of course, I had people around me being very efficient and very, very, very good. Uh, we began this work uh, two years ago. And we, of course, lots of preparation that's from the Green Group, been a heavy pressure on the Commission to come with something on plastic bags, not only plastic, but just a little bit, too, little bit different problems. Plastic bags, these lightweight plastic carrier bags, you know, you get them just for free everywhere. And we estimate that at least a hundred billion plastic bags are used in EU everywhere. Really many of them are used only one time. And uh, 8 billion are ending up as litter, you know, just like this here, probably many more. That means, you know, if they, they are flying around, they are causing troubles at sea. Uh, if you see, uh, you know, the garbage at sea, it's the Mediterranean, you see, it's the North Sea too. We consider, you know, that according to the uh, Commission's estimate, 70% of all this garbage is plastic, and there, 70% of this plastic is plastic bags. And they are coming out of beaches, everywhere. They're, going they're endangering wildlife as well, yeah, aren't they? Absolutely. You know, the birds, the seabirds in the North Sea, I only know the figures from the North Sea, in some species, and probably all of them, about 90% of the birds have plastic in their stomach. So we have a problem in Cyprus very often with our turtle nesting sites. Yeah, I could imagine, I could imagine, and fish, and you know, and they eat this plastic, and you cannot just go out and get it up because, you know, it, it, it uh, goes into a microplast, and uh, the real bad thing is, for instance, oxo degradable plastic. Well, I wanted to ask you why I'll those take that were edge, not edge. actually included yeah. in the directive, yeah. because in my humble opinion, those are actually more harmful to the environment than the ones that are big enough to collect. Yeah, and all the others. Oxo-degradable are worse than all of them, because oxo-degradable, they are not degradable. They fell apart. That's something different. And they turn into microplast. And it will stay in nature for generations. We don't know what happened, but uh, oxo-degradable, um, you know, it should really be banned. And I had a big majority in my delegation from the parliament, you know, from the other parties, as from the member states, to uh, have a, a demand of facing them out as soon as possible. But... But it was Britain, wasn't it, that exactly, came out against exactly. it? Yeah. Well, I was warned that uh, it could be a red line for Britain. And I need so much to keep all the member states unanimous behind this year because the Commission was against us. And that means that if just one country was leaving, then I could see how the Commission would try to split us. 
So can I, I ask in... you why the commission was against this? Or no, do you know why? Because, but I cannot explain it. I can say even the previous, the former commission, not Potosny, he was brilliant, but there's a secretary general in this commission, Catherine Day, and she's against environment, you know, and she's controlling everything. And it's, of course, her conditions are absolutely for her, based on this commission, which don't like, in, you know, to deal with the environment. That is, you know, small things, you know, big on big things, small on small things, and all this environment plastic bags. You can, you can hear them, you know, there's something, some lady stuff. You know, there's a feel. it's not a language I've heard. But it's a feeling I haven't got. Okay, but you managed to keep the countries together by yes. keeping Britain on board, by, yeah. by stepping they, back, basically, on the yes. supposedly biodegradable yes. bags. But we got into, uh, into the law that the Commission should provide us with a study. Well, we already have studies, but now they should make a real investigation on oxygen-degradable, which means that, you know, it will be evident and what we can do in, until then is just campaigning against it. The point is that all across the sort of political spectrum in the European yes. Parliament, almost every group was supporting this. Yes, but you know, UK was a problem. ECR, you heard it if you followed the debate. You could suddenly hear these guys. It was never he's a nice I like him, but he's in the board in this uh, industry which produces this uh, oxygenable uh, symphonies. It called it's well, not a big firm, but. You know, they're very close to the uh, British government. So, what about conflict of interest when things like this come up? How seriously yeah, does the European Parliament take that? It is absolutely conflict of interest, but, you know, a politician cannot be, you know, an, uh, an, an authority has to be absolutely clean. But, you know, politicians are linked to interest somewhere. Not. What we call for all of us is that these interests should be transparent. But, uh, you know, politicians cannot be hit by a conflict of interest as a, you know... We, well, we are, person. No, no, of course not. But what we can and should, must do is tell our electorates whom are we, whom are we working with, whom are, whom are lobbying us, uh, do we have uh, economical interests here and there, so that it's clear for, for the electorate who are we. So um, let me just come back to the whole plastic bags directive. It's been welcomed across the block, I yes, think, pretty well. Absolutely. Uh, when is it coming into force? What form is it going to take? Yeah. Because there was this business of whether you should just charge for the bags or whether you should try and cap the number of plastic bags yeah. per capita. And I didn't quite see how that could be enforced because how do you work out how many yeah. plastic bags I took home from the supermarket? Exactly. What we, uh, when we ended up, you know, it was a long process, but. Uh, the compromise we, we made with the, with the council was absolutely, apart from this with the oxygen degradable, was absolutely fine. We, we said that we, something has to be done. It's not enough for nice wishes, and, you know, as Timmermans and those people go for. No, something has to be done. And those who want to price all bags, that's all bags, perhaps not the very, very small one you use for... They, they have another uh, purpose because you can buy five apples instead of having a big pre-packed and so on. It has to be done, dealt with too, but the other member states have to find out how to do that. But these lightweight carrier bags, with the, you know, you can carry them. If, if you're pricing them, all of them, uh, which we, I personally recommend, it works quickly. You know, we, you well, it's been proved. Look at Ireland. Yeah, Ireland, and it's, I've just heard now that Portugal has done the same. Very, very efficient. They are so happy about it. I was told yesterday that Scotland has something, done some schemes similar. You know, it's not enough, and that's very important to keep in mind, just to put a tax on it, because taxes here, we have that in Denmark, but, you know, these taxes are running all, on all customers and all products, all goods, and it has no influence of the... Each and every uh, consumer. Or, yes, or you want individual consumers to say, yeah. I'm not paying yeah. X, Y, I and Z. Exactly. I will take my own bag, thank you very much, yeah. and over a year I will save so much money. Yeah, and you will find it natural always to have something with you, and sometimes you need to buy a bag, but that's okay. But you would be much more keen to have reusable bags. And you would think as well that local authorities, who are usually the ones clearing up, 
in their rubbish, going to their landfills or to their other form the, the of uh, recycling, saving. that they must be saving a lot of money, yeah. so you'd think they'd come on board to promote this, are I they? I can tell you, I, yeah, they should. I think I have the figures for, no, but, but I can them in my, my head. The society is save, uh, saving here with this reduction strategy. In 2010, in 11, it was estimated from the Commission that it was almost 740 million euro annually. And the two big parts are uh, the retailers, who they save a lot of money, but do not have to handle this out mm -hmm. for free, and then to sell the rest, you know, which is an income. The society will save from not producing all these bags because, you know, that is a considerable part of oil products for that, and uh, not collecting the litter, as you mentioned, you know, because cleaning up is also quite costly, and those who have coastal areas, as Cyprus had, you know, especially these, you know, minor societies will benefit a lot from not having to deal with this year. Well, this. I have to congratulate you for getting it through. Yeah. Can I, I just ask you what no, comes I, next? No, I just have to add, because now we just took a little sideline, that if you decide not to price which, of course, I will recommend, then you can uh, have a, a target uh, for reduction, and it's fixed. That means that in 2019, you should be down at 90 lightweight carrier bags per person annually. But how do you measure that? And exactly, and, there, and then just adding, and in 2025, down to 40, which means a 80% reduction at that time. And uh, the Commission is obliged to make a measurement during this year here so that we are presented with a reliable, equal uh, system. It's you know, more or less there, but you know, it can do it much better. So you, you know how many they are consuming. And the Commissioner Vela, who is very much on my side, and not with those who don't want to do anything, very much on my side, he was very clear in his answer yesterday and he was mentioning their obligations also to deliver within a year a good system, how they can measure how many bags you're using. As he also said, on the Oxford degradable, yes, we will do it, he said. So uh, he has really obliged his own DG environment to deliver. And so I am feel safe. But tell Cyprus, price bags, that helps a lot. This is the smartest, simplest way of doing it. Margaret Alken, who was the rapporteur getting the directive on plastic bags through the European Parliament. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. As moves continue to privatise our ports in Cyprus, businesses following a strike on Thursday are calling for laws regulating strikes at what they say are essential services. The fear is that more strike action will deal a heavy blow to the island's economy as it tries to recover. MPs have told unions that dialogue will continue and not all the workers did go out on strike on Thursday but it's fairly certain that as moves continue to privatise the ports there will be further industrial action. People in Nicosia are breathing a sigh of relief because the water supply is back. It was interrupted last Friday when the Tersefanu water pipeline, that's Nicosia's only water supply, was damaged during routine maintenance. Water cuts followed across the capital where a 12-hour schedule was introduced, meaning that a lot of people were without water for considerable periods of time. The Paphos Criminal Court ruled this week that there is a prima facie case against prominent developer Theodoros Aristodimou and three other people, including his wife, in connection with a land zoning case. However, the court has acquitted Aristodimou, his wife Rula, and former municipal engineer Savasava of attempted money laundering charges. 
The three, along with Aristo developer designer Christos Solomonides, will, however, face charges in connection with the demarcation of land in the Scali area of Paphos. The charges include forgery, circulation of a forged document, conspiracy, abuse of authority, and obtaining property under false pretenses. And some good news from the Electricity Authority of Cyprus. Regular listeners will know that here in Cyprus we pay one of the highest prices for our electricity. Well, the EAC has announced this week that there will be further price reductions by about 2% for people who pay monthly and 3% for consumers who have bi-monthly bills. Electricity prices have gradually been decreasing and, in fact, over the last 12 months have gone down by about about 20 percent. The EAC said that reductions have also been made on commercial and industrial tariffs, as well as on street lighting, water pumping and storage heaters. In collaboration with the Cyprus Mail, this is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. The biggest achievement of Crime Stoppers has been the ability of the public to be able to give information about crime anonymously. There's no way I could have kept prostituting without the drugs. There's no way I could have had my body used like a public toilet because that's actually what prostitution is. And then the fourth series I started three days after I'd won the Oscar, so the whole of the Monarch of the Glen experience was all interplatted with the Gosford Park Oscar experience. I was working with Ronnie James Dio, and David was going to reform White Snake in 2003. Cyprus was chosen because Cyprus is a stable, peaceful, and uh, secure place. We have to really look closely. What are we doing with children? What are we doing with adolescents? And what are we doing with adults that can help them move into a more literate uh, situation? The ones that I'm proudest of are the ones that were true discoveries, where we found something we didn't know existed. During my visit to the European Parliament in Strasbourg earlier this week, I spoke to one of our Cypriot MEPs, Dagis Hadjiorgiu. I asked him what he thought his role was as a member of the European Parliament. Since I am the Vice President of the JPC Committee, which is the Joint Parliamentary Committee between Turkey and the EU, uh, my main responsibility is uh, to see how Turkey can um, be one day member of the uh, European Union, and that means, in my mind, that they have to solve the Cyprus issue. And uh, if someone knows a bit about my um, uh, responsibilities in Cyprus as an MP, I worked a lot about the Cyprus issue, and that is something which uh, concern, uh, concern me a lot. Uh, I may say that this is my main goal in my life, to work to see uh, one day the Cyprus issue being solved. And that's what I currently do here, uh, meeting commissioners, uh, meeting a lot of uh, Turkish officials, uh, meeting a lot of parliamentarians, working within our group, I mean the, the leftist group of, of the parliament, to improve their knowledge about the current situation on, on the Cyprus problem, and of course to, to explain to them what do they do to solve it, what is the main problem uh, which doesn't help us to, to, to solve it, uh, why Turkey is the main obstacle to that, and of course nowadays to give to them some info about what happened in the Turkish Cypriot society uh, since they have elected a very progressive one, uh, Mr. Mustafa Akinji, someone who really in my opinion believes that we have to solve it. He is in line uh, with the United Nations resolutions and so on. Uh, so there is a window to, today to, to, to go on. We had, of course, unfortunately yesterday, the quarrel between Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Akinji, which gave the message that Turkey is there and uh, they want to intervene in, in the procedure, uh, not giving to the Turkish Cypriots the, their responsibilities. 
Of course, it's uh, very positive what uh, Mr. Akinji gave back as an answer. He stood up on his positions. And finally, I, I believe that, yes, he can manage to cooperate with Turkey in a way uh, to make them understand uh, that it's uh, also for their benefit uh, to solve it. Right, but if we look at your role as a member of the European Parliament, you've spoken there specifically about being vice-chair of the delegation on the EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee. That's only a very small part of your job. It may be an important part to you, obviously, because you've just explained why. What about the rest of your role as an MEP? Because there's a lot more to it than the Cyprus problem. I mean, you, you represent Cyprus as a, a Cypriot MEP, but you really have to be much more involved in the whole European political scene, don't you? You have a right to raise that issue, because uh, someone to be uh, convincing to, to all the others uh, has to work with uh, some others uh, to solve their problems. Uh, so, a uh, member of uh, the petition committee which means that we deal with a lot of uh, small or big problems of the citizens of Europe as a whole. For example, even for um, the pollution of a river in uh, Bulgaria or uh, somewhere else. So we go through, oh, I can't say millions, but thousands of petitions working to solve specific problems of the citizens of Europe. Uh, I deal a lot with the migration problem. Uh, because uh, this is an issue which uh, if Europe can't deal effectively with, uh, it will be one day uh, a bomb in, in, in our hands. So how do you think we should deal with it? Well, first of all, I believe that we have to stop the... we have to, to, to see what is the reason of that. And in my belief, the reason of that is uh, the wars happening in these areas, I mean Syria, Iraq, Iran, and uh, of course these wars happened because of the intervention of the United States. And uh, that um, made uh, part of this population to explode, let's say so. And having a war in your country, the first option is to leave. Uh, so if, you, if we can't stop the war, uh, we can't stop the, 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 the migration. The migration. Uh, secondly, of course, we, we need to, to organize the regulations in Europe about, about that in order to see these people coming as humans, uh, who they have rights, uh, who they have um, uh, the, the necessity they, to, to be treated as, as human beings. But they also have the potential, if you look back over European history, it was built by migrants just about. The economic success of many countries is built on people migrating to work. Why do you think, and particularly now let's talk about Cyprus, because we are one of the frontline countries to some degree, and yet we seem to have this policy that we don't want them regardless, and I'm sure we're not alone in Europe, but certainly it's very obvious in Cyprus. Is there anything that as an MEP you feel you can do about that? Let me tell you that Australia has been created by immigrants. And now you can see the Australians uh, uh, throwing stones to the immigrants who are coming today there. Unfortunately, the citizens in Europe, some citizens in Europe, not to blame all of them, uh, they believe that the unemployment is because of the immigrants, which is a very, very uh, false um, concept. So my work as an MEP is to work with the citizens, to give them the right info saying that uh, these people never created a problem in the line of your unemployment. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the emigrants, as you mentioned before, are the people who work to create the Europe as we know it today. It's, it's a very difficult task, let me tell you, but still we are fighting for that. Your message finally to the constituents back in Cyprus who voted for you, people who perhaps didn't vote for you, what do you say to them as one of their MEPs? 
because we de- we tend not to think of you guys very much. You do realise that, don't you? What, once the elections yeah, are over, you come, you, you come to Brussels and Strasbourg, mm. and then we forget about you until the mm. next election. We don't really know what you're doing for us. Yeah, I can understand that because uh, the media don't give the um, info needed about what we are doing here. That's why I'm giving you the opportunity. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I, I want to tell them that uh, we work heartily, day and night. It's a very, very difficult job, not to mention that we need 10 hours to come here and we lost a lot of our uh, daily life on, on the planes. Uh, but being here, uh, we are uh, day and night upon papers working to improve them, thinking that uh, one day we can create a, a Europe which is uh, closer uh, to their um, uh, perfection of what they think Europe has to be. Cypriot MEP Tagis Hadjiorgiu. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.